Okay. Yes, I know this video took far too long to come out. Now, after nearly 10 years, it's time for me to do the one thing FNAF fans struggle with the most reading. I actually still have my OG version of the Silver Eyes back when it first came out, but as you can kind of see, it got ruined, and if you know, you know, and if you do know, I am so sorry. I haven't actually read this book in a while, so it'll be kind of fun to reread it in full. Obviously, I remember most of the core plot of the entire trilogy, as it's still brought up in debates on Twitter from time to time, but I won't really be talking about many theories or, like, how it correlates to the games in this video. I'm more so just going to be talking about the Silver Eyes itself. I'll bring up other things and compare it to other things, but you get the idea. I'm also trying not really to take into account the other two books, since they had yet to exist, obviously. So most of my criticisms with the Silver Eyes, yes, they might be answered in some of the later books, but this is looking at just the Silver Eyes, and when this came out, we just had the Silver Eyes, so that's what I'm going to be looking at. Also, before anyone says anything, yes, I will be using the graphic novel for visuals every now and then. I only point this out because I know how strongly people feel about the artist, she who shall not be named. And trust me, I get it. I know why people feel that way, but it's just to help with visuals from the video. My review is not about the graphic novel or any of the small changes the graphic novel made. That will not have any input on what I think about the Silver Eyes. So I'm just talking about the novel, like I said. I, I just want to preface that before anyone says anything. Before we get into all that, let me paint a picture for you. It's 2015. FNAF was at a pretty high peak. We had just had four games in 11 months and a cute little RPG, but the series was kind of winding down a little as we went several months without anything new. A decent amount of people believed it was actually over, which is fair considering a lot of the FNAF 4 teasers told us that it was the final chapter. It was during this time between FNAF 4 and Sister Location that FNAF just suddenly became cringe overnight on the internet, like the exact same thing happened to Minecraft at the exact same time. You'd get shit on for liking these things online. I didn't really care. It is what it is. But shockingly, in early December of that year, we got a very interesting and surprising teaser for something called Five Nights at Freddy's The Untold Story. As the days passed, Scott Games would continuously get updated to reveal a release date and then the title itself, Five Nights at Freddy's The Silver Eyes. We now knew by this point that it was also a novel and that he had actually been working on it for about 10 months, which is a detail that not a lot of people talk about, because that would mean that he was actually working at least the very early bits of this novel during FNAF 3's development, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Not, not a lot of people bring that up, but I think it's really interesting. But then finally we got the release date and it was revealed to be the 22nd of December, so you know damn well what my ass asked for Christmas. Okay, so now we get to the more hefty part of the video, and you'll have to let me know if this level of story recap was even necessary, so uh, I will apologize ahead of time as I've never really done a story recap on this caliber before, so bear with me, but we'll try to run through most of it here. By this point, also, I'm assuming you've read the book, otherwise, I don't know why you're here, and uh, from this point on, obviously, there will be spoilers, because I'm literally going to be telling you the story. The book opens with a short flash forward where Charlie, our protagonist, whose name should ring an immediate bell if you've played the first six games, we find her crawling behind some arcade cabinets trying to hide from Foxy, which reminds me a lot of Abby hiding in the arcade from Foxy as well. The flash forward edges us by cutting off right when Foxy finds her. Now, the actual opening of the book is Charlie returning to Hurricane Utah in 1995. Ten years after a series of murders in 1985, she was returning to the town for a scholarship being made slash named slash given in the name of one of her childhood friends Michael, who lost his life in the aforementioned series of child murders. It's sort of a ten-year memorial ceremony. I don't really understand what it was that they were honoring Michael with. Like, they're giving away a scholarship in his name or his name now. I don't, I don't really know. I, that's just a part of the book that I was just like, Cool. Charlie had arrived a little earlier in order to visit her old house before she met up with all her friends. It was a dilapidated old house at the edge of town. Going to her old house and straight up to her old childhood room basically to show us all the really cool toys her father had made her when she was young. There was Theodore, a purple rabbit plush that had a speaker in him that would play a recording of her father saying, I love you, Charlie. Very wholesome. Then there was Ella the doll who would come out of the closet on tracks to deliver a little teacup. It's honestly funny how much representation Ella has outside of the Silver Eyes. An Ella-like doll appears in fact Fazbear Fright Story 1.35 AM as the main focus, and we get to see Springlock Ella in the movie. Like, I know that's only two appearances, but that's still funny to me for some reason. It's mentioned that Charlie had had an identical outfit to Ella. Dude, had had bothers me so much. Like, it's grammatically correct, but it looks so fucking whacked. Oh yeah, and then there was also this fuck-ass unicorn named Stanley, I guess. After her short nostalgic trip to her house, she goes back into town to meet up with her childhood friend group, who were all called back to the town to attend the memorial for Michael. There was Jessica, a tall, pretty, thin woman with shoulder-length brown hair, at least that's how Charlie describes her, but as you can see in the graphic novel, they changed her to blonde, so I just thought I should point that out. Then there was Carlton, a red-headed bloke, and John, who was basically just a default male character, I'm gonna be honest. Although I will give 
give John some points for giving Charlie cookies out of his Transformers lunchbox when they were kids, Transformers Riz is highly respectable. But basically to sum up a little bit of the relationships, John and Charlie had kind of had a thing back when they were young, and that will continue being a very prominent thing throughout the book. And there would actually be two more friends who would be arriving the following morning. They go on to catch up and try to talk about things they've been up to for the past 10 years, but very quickly they resort to talking about all their memories with Freddy's when they were younger. Freddy was John's favorite and Jessica was Bonnie's. She would try to vent to him when no one else was around near the stage, which is just the funniest thing to me, I don't know why. Charlie tries to think back, quote, I sometimes feel like I remember every inch of it, like Carlton, but sometimes it's like I don't remember at all. It's all in pieces. Like I remember the carousel and when it got stuck, I remember drawing on the placemats. I remember the little things, eating that greasy pizza, hugging Freddy in the summer and his yellow fur getting all over my clothes, but a lot of it is like pictures, like it happened to somebody else." End quote. The group is naturally confused by this and corrects Charlie on the color of Freddy's fur, that being brown, not yellow. They ask Carlton, who was the only member of the group that never moved out of town, whatever happened to Freddy Fazbear's? Curiosity starts to eat away at them and they start getting the strong urge to go check out the building. They basically ask Charlie for permission since she was a little bit more personally involved in the story of Freddy's than the rest of them. Her father was an owner of the restaurant. However, when they arrived, instead of finding Freddy's, they found a rather large building in its place. Sounds, uh, kind of familiar to have a big mall built around what was once uh, Freddy Fazbear's. Hmm. Carlton knew there was construction down here, but never actually went and checked it out. They all questioned why it was built, just to never actually be finished. Despite there being no Freddy's, they still decided to go into the building anyway to take a curious look around. As they start exploring within the building, they hear a set of footsteps in the distance. They realize that it's some sort of guard within the building. They run quickly into the unfinished shops and try to hide from the guard. As they move through the shops, they pass into a small alley where they quickly realize they had found the outer wall of Freddy's. Proven by the words, Carlton smells like feet scribbled on the side of the wall. Lamau. They found a side door that was covered by a shelf. Using it to enter the building, they are instantly bewildered standing in the dining room. It was like it was frozen in the final moments of it being open. One thing that I find really interesting is they actually refer to Bonnie as blue in the book, so it actually wasn't the movie that started that debate whether Bonnie was purple or blue. I just thought I should point that out. I find that really interesting. Not only is he blue in the movie and this book, but also he's blue in FNAF World, so I think Bonnie's just blue, guys. I think we gotta accept that at this point. It's also interesting to me that Pirate's Cove isn't even in the main dining room like FNAF 1. Instead, it's in its own private party room, kind of like Kid's Cove in FNAF 2 almost. As they continue to look around reliving their childhood, John swears he hears a faint music box, but obviously that's nothing and they just brush it off. While Charlie, Jessica, and John are at Pirate's Cove, Carlton knocks over a bunch of stuff in the kitchen, causing a really loud crashing noise. So the group not only runs out of Freddy's, but the mall itself in fear of the guard having heard the noise. They can't help but slip back into their childhood selves while in Freddy's, even to the point that they giggle as they run back to Charlie's car. After that little bit of goofiness, they travel to a motel where they'd be staying overnight to prepare for the ceremony tomorrow. Jessica and Charlie share a room. Charlie and Jessica have some girl boss talk, where we learn that Jessica is supposed to be pretty smart and wants to be an archaeologist. This bears no purpose to the plot, I just think she's kinda cool. The following morning, Charlie is woken up by one of her old friends knocking on the door of the motel. It was Marla, one of the aforementioned friends I said that would be coming today. She also, surprisingly, brought her little brother Jason. The girls get ready and meet the boys at the diner from the previous night. The other friend that I mentioned had also arrived. His name was Lamar. They all awkwardly try to catch up with each other again. Lamar mentions that he'd actually moved to Indianapolis after the incident because he's kind of goaded. All jokes aside, they actually start having a really interesting conversation about the concept of ghosts. Charlie doesn't believe in straight up spirits, but the idea of memories lingering like ghosts. That a place almost reflects the memories held within it, like her house. This feels to me almost like the earliest idea of what Remnant would become in the future, which is just really cool to see the seeds of that planted so early on. Meaning, by the way, since this book was being developed during the FNAF 3 era, that Remnant was probably in his head when he was making FNAF 3, perhaps. I'm just saying. Scott might be kind of goaded. Charlie, Jessica, John, and Carlton tell Lamar and Marla how they went to Freddy's that night before. Just a tad bit of a flex. After eating, they arrive at the ceremony, which is held in a football field behind the school. They are slightly surprised at the amount of people who were there, but as Marla points out, it's a small town and, quote, people remember. Unquote. That line really reminds me of the note you can find in Security Breach about people criticizing the Pizza Plex, asking, quote, Why did you reopen? Everyone remembers what happens to those kids. Unquote. Which is just an interesting coincidence that I wanted to bring up. Michael's parents give a small speech before giving away the scholarship, but I do find it slightly odd how it's only Michael and not the other four victims too. Although they do mention the other four victims, but I guess it is because it's their kid, but I don't know. Now, although this portion of the book is a slower buildup than some people would like, it gives us a lot of time with Charlie and her headspace helping us really understand her feelings as well as her clear struggles with grief and memories. It helps her feel like a real person, and you kind of get attached to that to some degree. 
For example, one of my favorite moments of characterization from this early part of the book is when Charlie sees a picture Michael had drawn. Quote, Charlie looked at the drawing. Whatever it was, it was better than she could draw now. Suddenly, her chest tightened, gripped with loss and rage. It wasn't just that Michael died young, it was what that truly meant. He had been stopped in his tracks. Years, decades of his life snatched away and torn violently from him. She felt herself well up with youthful indignation, as if she were a child again, wanting only to whine. It's not fair. End quote. Showing us how much this event affected her on a deeper level than she even understands herself. After the ceremony, Charlie plans on going back to her old house again, when John asks if he could come too. Charlie agrees, and they head there together. Charlie doesn't feel as if she can have him inside, it's like a private thing for her, so they just go and sit down by a tree. Down Bad John has a memory from when they were like six of him trying to convince Charlie to kiss him before her father caught them. Charlie thinks back as well, but not about John, but about playing on the floor of her father's workshop, which was in the garage. There had been multiple mentions by this point in the book of Charlie's fear of an endoskeleton that sat in her father's workshop, its silver eyes burning into her mind. He said it! He said it! She thinks a little bit ahead to another time when she first got to meet a freshly built Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica. It is heavily implied that Bonnie is directly based on Theodore, the plush rabbit I mentioned earlier, making it kind of how, like, William built Circus Baby for his daughter. Here, Charlie's father built Bonnie for her, kinda. From all this thinking back, John realizes something in his memory that he had kind of forgotten. He goes on about how before Michael had disappeared, he saw a yellow bear in the room with everyone. While they were all distracted by the animatronics on stage, both the yellow bear and Michael had vanished. John describes the eyes staring back at him from the suit as dead, obviously alive, blinking, and seeing, but whatever was behind those eyes had died a long time ago, at least on the inside. They don't really do much with this revelation, and decide to keep a lot of it private, and just go meet back up with the rest of the group who was already at the mall parking lot. The seven of them then snuck back into the mall. They almost get caught by the guard yet again, and Jason swears the guard saw him, but the guard continued walking away. Jason remains nervous about the guard coming back, so Lamar tries to calm him down. Hey Jason, Lamar said, what do you think the guard would do if he saw us? Shoot us? Jason whimpered. Worse community service. For some reason, this made me genuinely laugh. Once inside Freddy's yet again, Jessica finds a small trap door on the side of the stage that leads to a control room underneath. It was filled with CCTV cams as well as controls for the animatronic performances. Jason flips a power switch, causing everyone to wonder why the building even still has power at this point. They start fiddling around with the animatronic controls, but briefly, both Marla and Lamar thought that they could hear a music box in the distance, but it's nothing. So they decide to just pass it off. For whatever reason, during all of this, Down Bad John decides to play hide and seek with Charlie. But to my surprise, she agrees and runs down the hallway while John counts to 100. Meanwhile, Jason finds the arcade and starts kind of vibing. That is, until he notices that one of the drawings had changed on the wall from the last time he had looked at it. Before, it was Bonnie hugging a kid, but now the kid was facing away from Bonnie. Jason decides to take the drawing and pocket it. Back in the control room, Jessica fiddles with the sound system along with Carlton, Marla, and Lamar. But briefly within the static, they believe they can hear a voice of some kind, but they can't really make anything out. After getting slightly bored, Carlton and Marla decide to go exploring and end up finding another control room, one specifically for Pirate's Cove, and another set of CCTV cams covering other parts of the building. Charlie, who was still hiding from John, decides to hide in Pirate's Cove. She had not thought about where she was before feeling Foxy looming over her from behind. She has a small panic attack of sorts, and we learn that the Endo that she was always scared of was actually Foxy long before he was given that name. Marla in the control room presses a button, causing Foxy to slash Charlie's arm as she falls out of the cove. Thankfully, she's caught by Down Bad John. Charlie was bleeding from a supposed four-inch cut, according to the book. It wasn't bad enough to kill her, but it did make her dizzy. She mentions the cut did not hurt as much as it should have, which is an interesting, maybe perhaps sussy thing to say? Everyone had now rushed into the private party room after hearing Charlie scream, and they're all brought back to reality after seeing Charlie's injury, deciding to leave for the night. As they walk down the hallway to the exit, Jason keeps thinking he sees drawings moving and shifting in the corner of his eyes, but he's never able to actually catch them moving. After getting some bandages for Charlie, the group decides to all stay in Jessica and Charlie's motel room. Charlie and John wake up much earlier than the others and have a walk in the woods. During the walk, Charlie just sort of randomly decides to reveal to John that there was a location before Freddy's, one that she can just barely remember. The memories being so faint, she likens them to a dream fading away. All she can remember is her mom was still around, and how Charlie was always with another young boy. They were supposedly always together. She then goes on to mention a golden bear and a yellow rabbit who roamed around the place singing and dancing for the customers. Now being older, she realizes that those suits were worn by people, but sometimes were also animatronics. The boy she mentioned liked when people wore them, but Charlie liked them better as animatronics. John asks the obvious question of who the boy was, and Charlie reveals that it was her twin brother. She desperately tries to search through what little and vague memory she had to try and remember its location. From a song she remembers her parents singing, they deduce that it's possibly in a town called Harmony just north of Hurricane. 
can. John encourages Charlie to go look for it, and they set out together. After having a small schizo meltdown and running through a field, Charlie finds the long-abandoned diner. While catching up, John spots a sign that reads, Fredbear's Family Diner. So crazy. Unlike Freddy's, Fredbear's was cleared out and empty. After searching around a little, Charlie triggers a long-suppressed memory, a memory of the yellow rabbit taking her brother. It stared at them, like he was trying to decide which of them to take, and then it yanked her brother from her. Her memory ends with her screaming, her father holding her as she continued screaming louder and louder. Soon after that, the diner closed and her mother had left. Charlie had finally remembered her twin's name, Sammy. Charlie breaks down and begins to cry, and so John holds her. She tells him everything we just learned from that memory, and he links the yellow rabbit to the golden bear from his memory. When they returned back to Hurricane, they realized they had spent most of the day out there. Once they made it back to the motel, they found a note from Marla saying that everyone had gone to Freddy's again, so they head there as well, meeting up with everyone in the parking lot yet again. <laughs> they go to sneak into the building. However, this time, the guard was standing there waiting for them at the entrance. Charlie sees that Dave is the name displayed on his name tag. He threatens to have them arrested for trespassing, but Charlie remembers Carlton's dad as a cop. During Dave scolding them, Charlie decides to just absolutely destroy this man Dave in her mind. Quote, Charlie looked at the man, considering him the ill-fitting uniform, his peaky, almost exhausted-looking features. He really could kick them off the property, or even have them arrested for trespassing, but still, she could not fear him. His inadequacy shone through him like a kind of negative charisma, end quote. Bro has negative riz, man, that's, that's wild. Even she admits in her head that she went a little hard on him. Before anything continued, Charlie came up with the big brain plan to ask Dave if he'd just like to take a look in there too, which, to everyone's surprise, he agrees. Dave, having supposedly worked there for a while now, had also noticed the building encased back there. He tells them that he always wanted to look back there himself, so the group leads him to the entrance. On the way there, Lamar asks Dave why the mall was built here and why it was never finished. Dave explains that the town needed money and jobs, and they decided to build the mall to try and attract business, and maybe even tourists. He goes on to explain that no one would lease Freddy's due to what happened. So it was built around it and sealed by, quote, someone who had sentimental attachment to it, perhaps, end quote. However, it didn't work out. Despite the building being sealed, its aura almost seemed to leak out and contaminate the entire building with a strange vibe. No one wanted to bring their business here. So the mall was never finished and left behind. As they walk into Freddy's, Charlie notices a small scar on Dave's neck and a mirrored identical scar on the other side. Jason decides to confide in Lamar and tell him about the moving drawing, but Lamar doesn't believe him. Jason then goes on to find three more drawings that had changed, still not able to see it happening, but he knows they changed. He takes them off the wall and places them on the ground with the image he took from last night. As he puts them next to each other on the floor, they start forming a story, this time moving right in front of Jason. It shows a character, whom Jason believes to be Bonnie, stalking a crying child. And suddenly, a loud wind-like sound emerged as the pages began falling from the wall, crashing onto the ground as if they were made of something far heavier than paper. The wind noise got louder and it started to sound like a scream. The pages turned red and bled onto the floor. Jason turned to run, but was blocked by a seemingly infinite amount of pages falling from the ceiling. They started falling onto him, sticking to him, covering him as if they were trying to suffocate him. The weight of the paper caused him to fall to his knees, but suddenly and immediately the pages all disappeared. The red stains vanished. Everything was normal. Marla grabbed him, obviously concerned, asking him what was wrong. He tried telling her, but like Lamar, she didn't believe him, even going as far to call Jason an embarrassment. Like, bitch, calm down. It's not that deep. Meanwhile, the group was showing Dave the control room under the stage. Charlie and John become increasingly more suspicious of Dave as he works the performance controls effortlessly. While doing so, Bonnie starts going absolutely insano style on the stage. Tweaking, twitching, his eyes rolling back. Dave seemed unfazed by Bonnie, calling him a quote, nervous little fella, unquote. Lamar tries to put a stop to the performance but Bonnie's movements only got more violent and erratic. Freddy and Chica and even the building itself start tweaking, the lights flashing and strobing violently. While everyone is distracted by the commotion on the stage, Dave vanishes. Sound familiar? He confidently walks down a hallway towards an office, unlocking the door with his key and heading into the closet. Meanwhile, Jason, who was trying to gain his bearings, spots Bonnie stalking the group but disappearing with the strobing lights. He tries to warn the group, but Marla points out to him that Bonnie's still up on the stage. But yet again, Jason spots Bonnie moving and lurking, disappearing yet again. Jason gets the big brain idea of splitting off from the group and trying to follow and investigate. He continues following where he thought Bonnie had gone, ending up at Pirate's Cove, where he runs into Carlton, who was in the stage. But in a quick motion, Carlton is grabbed from behind and pulled in by the Yellow Rabbit. After Carlton had been dragged into the darkness of Pirate's Cove, Foxy emerged from it, moving far more purposefully than the other three on the main stage. Charlie and John run to grab Jason and bring him out of the building with everyone else. The group escapes without Carlton. 
Realizing this, they head straight into town to get help from the police, making them some of the only horror protagonists to ever go to the police. They spot a cop on the sidewalk. Jessica and Marla get his attention and try to tell him what's been going on. Meanwhile, Charlie randomly decides to think back at a time where she and Marla played with store-bought walkie-talkies. I, like, I get that the cop was using a radio, but there are a few little moments like this throughout the book where it feels like the pacing should be much faster, but things then get slowed down ever so slightly with some random thing like this. Like, the memory she describes only lasts a few lines, and it wasn't at all important, so I wonder what really was the point of including it. It's not like before where I said slower paced moments can add more to Charlie's character, but playing with walkie-talkies once when they were five adds nothing to Charlie or Marla's character. But when they reached the entrance to Freddy's, it was sealed with three massive padlocks and bolts. I don't know how Dave managed to speedrun this shit in like 15 minutes. I guess Home Depot was open late that night. The cop brings them back out to the parking lot, believing it to be some sort of prank. As they continue to explain that Carlton is stuck in there, Officer Dunn radios Clay, Carlton's father, who is the chief of police, to come down to the scene immediately. After showing up, Clay doesn't take the situation seriously, confidently believing his son is pulling some kind of prank on the group. So, he invites them back to his house to wait for Carlton to show back up. While back at their home, Clay talks about how he was actually on the Freddy's case. He himself arrested the main suspect, but much like we learned from the FNAF 1 newspapers, because they couldn't find the bodies, they couldn't stick him with anything despite Clay being confident it was the aforementioned suspect. He expresses immense disappointment for the group going back there, and singles out Charlie specifically. Time had passed while he was telling his story and lecturing them and realized it was past midnight. He offers the group to stay overnight in their two guest rooms. Charlie takes the second room for herself and the other six take the other room. She wanted to be alone. I'd be highly annoyed personally if someone just took a whole ass room to herself and the other six motherfuckers have to go to the other room. Charlie relives a memory in her dreams. She was a little girl again. She could feel that something was wrong. Not knowing what, she gets out of bed and sneaks down the hallway to the stairs. As she reached the bottom of the stairs, she realized she was no longer a little girl. She was back to her present teenage self. The front door was wide open, rain pouring in. The endo from her father's workshop was there, twitching and convulsing, and with a twitching motion its hand rose and reached out towards her face. Right before it touched her, it became motionless. Its silver eyes had dimmed only for it to suddenly reawaken and hurl its body forward, crashing into a lamp. Charlie then ran back upstairs, screaming for her father. As she got closer to the top of the stairs, she got smaller and smaller. She was a little girl again. She hid behind her father, who was now standing in the hallway. Unlike any other time, hiding behind her father did not bring her comfort. As Foxy slowly climbed the stairs, her father confidently walked forward and put his hands around its head. After doing something she could not see, Foxy powered down. Charlie backed into her room to hide. She gave one last look back into the hallway just to see Foxy's silver eyes move to meet her gaze. She was shocked awake by this. It was very early in the morning, so she went down to the porch to relax. And yet again, just like when she woke up early at the hotel, Dom Bad John is right there with her. Charlie then asks John what some people thought about her dad. She was referring to him in general, but John misunderstood and thought she was referring to the Freddy's case. He reveals that some people actually thought her father killed those kids. Despite getting offended by this, she briefly grapples with it in her mind, whether or not her dad did it. After this, Charlie and John went back to sleep. Marla bangs on the door to wake up Charlie and tell her that breakfast was done. Clay had made pancakes for everyone. Carlton's mom joins the group for breakfast. She is the district attorney for the county. She's only just now informed that Carlton had still not returned from Freddy's. She gets understandably upset that she wasn't even informed that her son had not come home last night, prank or not. Carlton's parents then argue about how Clay was not taking this seriously since it was Freddy's. Clay still confidently believes Carlton will just show up and that he's probably still sleeping wherever he was staying the night at. In the heat of the argument, Clay accidentally mentions seeing Michael's blood all over the floor of Freddy's in front of a bunch of kids who knew him, which is incredibly fucked up. And I'm gonna have to side with Carlton's mom here though, cause like, I get Carlton plays pranks, but like, to not even entertain the idea of six people telling you he's stuck in a building is a little whack. But Clay concedes and calls to send Officer Dunn to search for Carlton at Freddy's. When Officer Dunn had returned to the door that was sealed the night before, it was now cracked open. He enters and begins searching the place. He eventually stumbles into the office that Dave had unlocked the previous night. He finds the yellow rabbit costume just slumped over in a closet. Unfortunately, the suit was not empty, and it lunges forward, taking Dunn down pretty easily, breaking his arm in the process. The yellow rabbit stabbed Dunn deep in his chest, holding him close like in an embrace as he bled out. Kind of unfortunate, that... That poor, poor, random-ass dude. While the group stayed behind at Carlton's house finishing up their breakfast, Charlie and John head back to Charlie's house yet again. This time, she wanted them to come inside. Pause. John had not been in her room since they were little, but out of all things, he recognizes the fuck-ass unicorn Stanley. John asks about what was ever in her third closet, which she always called her 
big girl closet. She says she doesn't remember, but does think she came back once with her aunts for some clothes. While John continues playing with the toys, Charlie decides to search her father's room. She looks at several books on her father's bookshelf, things from human anatomy to animals, but alongside all that, a book called The History of the Traveling Circus. Underneath all this on a bottom shelf, she finds a photo album and decides to bring it back to her room to show John. But now here we have another example of really weird pacing. Instead of just getting to the point and opening it up with them, they very briefly watch Ella the doll come out of the first closet, do her little thing, and go back in. Charlie and John do not bond over it, and it adds nothing of importance. It's just three extra random lines just for right after to get to the photo album. It's not the end of the world since it's only three lines, but you get what I mean? Anyway, the existence of Sammy is fully confirmed from pictures in the photo album. After looking through pictures of her and her family, Charlie yet again grapples with the possibility of her father being behind everything. Just like back at Fredbear's, Charlie cried in John's arms. She wasn't mourning, she just felt empty. After calming down, she decides to tell John how her father game ended himself. So, essentially, he built an animatronic specifically to stab him. Yeah. Charlie was at school at the time, so her aunt had to come pick her up. Charlie knew that had to mean something bad, which is relatable because I was literally never brought out of school without it being because of something bad happening. Apart from being sick, of course, and the one time my dad picked me up early to see Captain America Civil War on release. Her aunt carried her into the house and up the stairs, trying to keep her from seeing the scene in the living room. I'm not sure why bro did all that to Game End, and did that shit in the living room. Like, he could have at least done it in his workshop, right? But back in the present, Charlie puts herself together and tries to put the photo album back where she found it. However, it just wouldn't fit back in, like a memory that can't be set right. Get it, guys? It's like symbolism and shit. In her frustration, she tries to force the photo album back in, causing a ton of books to fall off the shelf which causes John to find an old photo with her father in the Golden Freddy suit, and someone in the Yellow Rabbit suit right next to him. Frustrated and curious for more answers, they go to the library to find any information they can about Fred Bears or the man in the Yellow Rabbit costume. They find a newspaper archive dating back to the late 70s and early 80s. They find an article about the day of Sammy's disappearance. Through the article, they learn that Fred Bears was co-created by her father and another man. There was a picture of her father and a face they both recognized. Before they can say anything, Marla rushes into the library to inform John and Charlie that Jason has disappeared and assuming he's going back to Freddy's. Carlton finally wakes up, finding himself restrained in the torso of a mascot costume. Before he can really do anything, a yellow rabbit dances in the room, does a fruity little twirl, and bows. Taking off his mask reveals Dave. Who could have guessed? Carlton quickly puts together that this had to be what happened to Michael and the other kids. They were lured back here and never seen again. Dave warns Carlton to not move around and try to escape, as he was in a springlock suit's torso. The suit Carlton was in was supposedly one of the first suits Henry made. Henry is the name of Charlie's father, whom I had avoided saying his name since it hadn't been revealed yet in the book, but I'm assuming most of you already knew that, but... <laughs> Going further in his TED Talk explanation of Springlocks to Carlton, Dave takes off his torso of the Yellow Rabbit suit to reveal his body is covered in scars from having suffered multiple Springlock-related injuries. However, the group now arrives at Freddy's in search of Jason and Carlton. The door to Freddy's was now fully sealed with welded metal sheets. The group finds and follows Jason's footprints to a side vent, however, none of them can really fit. Jessica tries because she's the skinniest, but it's a really tight fit and she's claustrophobic. Trying to protect Jessica from having to admit her fear and go in alone, Charlie tells them of another way in from a skylight on the roof. Down Bad John is weirdly overly flirty slash playful with Charlie as they are desperately trying to find a way onto the roof. Like, my guy, we are searching for two of your missing friends and Dog is taking every opportunity to be playful with her. This is what I mean when I say bro is down bad. Like, I get that comedy can be used as a coping mechanism, but keep it in your pants, bruv. But after some struggle, they find their way up and finally make their way through the skylight. Lamar hands out two walkie-talkies he brought that he got from Carlton's dad. Charlie thinks this implies that Clay knew they would come back here again. The group splits up to use both control room CCTV cameras to try and search for Jason and Carlton. However, on their way to the private party room, Marla quickly finds Jason near Pirate's Cove. Lamar, in the Pirate's Cove control room, spots Dave on the cams. He radios Jessica's group to warn them. The three of them run to the control room under the stage. Meanwhile, Carlton was very slowly trying to inch towards a camera in the room, hoping someone would see him. However, he stopped as he noticed one of the other suits in the room was looking right at him, with small glowing lights in its eyes, calling to him. Back with Lamar, he notices that Bonnie is no longer on stage. He attempts to warn the others over the radio, but before he could, Charlie had spotted Carlton on cams and immediately womaned up to go find him. 
John and Jessica try to stop her, but as soon as she leaves to go solo the verse, the control room door slams behind her. Charlie then continued into the main dining room, stumbling in the dark and bumping right into Bonnie, standing in the center of the room. The cameras go static, preventing anyone from keeping track of Charlie. She runs into the bathrooms to try and hide from Bonnie, locking herself in a stall and sitting up on the toilet lid. However, she can't resist the urge to peek over the stall to try and see if Bonnie was there. He was, and locked eyes with her. As he starts banging on her stall, trying to almost uproot it from the ground, she crawls underneath the stalls. As she continues crawling, she stops as Bonnie had gone quiet. She realized that Bonnie was leaning down under the stalls to try and cut her off. Charlie notes how badly Bonnie's breath stinks when he opens his mouth. Charlie then takes off as fast as possible before Bonnie can even stand back up. On her way back to the control room, she notices that Chica was no longer up on the stage with Freddy. So she continues just running through the building and accidentally stumbles into Carlton. Charlie meticulously disarms the spring locks and frees Carlton. Carlton confirms with Charlie that Dave is the killer and was the same person who took those kids all the way back in the 80s, telling her his theory that Dave more than likely lured them back to this room while everyone was distracted, much like we know by this point from the games and even the opening of the movie. He then explains to her how the kids were stuffed in the suits and were still here, and the suit he saw earlier, the Golden Freddy, was Michael. Meanwhile, Foxy crawls into the Pirate's Cove control room with Lamar, Marla, and Jason. After not spotting them and not being able to fully fit into the room, Foxy retreats. Jason immediately gets up and shuts the door, alerting Foxy, who was just there, to quickly force the door back open. Jason was then dragged out of the room by Foxy's hook in his leg. Lamar has to hold Marla back from trying to chase after her brother. Dave then enters the room with Charlie and Carlton. Charlie hides on the wall behind the door and knocks Dave over the head with a pipe. He falls over and collapses onto the floor as they run out. They continue running through the building until they get to the kitchen, in which they run into Chica, who forces them back out into the main room. John and Jessica kick through the door of the control room and meet Charlie and Carlton in the main room. They make their way down another hallway and find an old office to hide in. Marla then informs them over the radio that Jason was missing and that Foxy had took him. Hearing that triggers Charlie to have a very brief flashback to Foxy standing at the end of the hall in her house, his silver eyes burning into her mind. And now, after everything that has just happened, the pacing is weirdly slow again. Like, it felt like it was pretty climactic, but now Charlie and Jessica are just slowly scouting a way back out looking at the skylight they use to get in, while John keeps an eye out on Carlton, who is not doing very well from his injuries. It's just a whole page of them going back to the skylight, just for them to realize they can't really escape back through it, and just go right back to the office. It just feels weird. Like, I get that it's kind of a regrouping moment, but it just kind of feels like a wasted page to check the skylight to deduce that there's no way out, which is something they already assumed when they got in there in the first place. But anyway, they also realize Carlton is not doing well and is getting worse, assuming he has a pretty bad concussion. Knowing that there's no way out, they go back and try to decide to get some answers out of Dave, who is still out cold. While searching the back room to try and find something to tie Dave up with, they find Officer Dunn's body stuffed away. They then find some cord to tie Dave up with, but yet again, in this very strange and dire situation, Down Bad John jokes playfully with Charlie about when they played cops and robbers as kids. This being right after they found a dead cop and are tying up an unconscious man. What is wrong with you? Dave then wakes up and is incredibly unresponsive. Carlton then explains to the whole group what he'd explained to Charlie, and in that moment, the entire group clicked at once. This was the man that killed their friend and all those kids 10 years ago. Enraged by that revelation, John clocks the shit out of Dave. Charlie then realizes the seemingly brain-dead Dave was staring at the yellow rabbit head on the table, so she decides to just put it on him, and he immediately becomes responsive. However, his voice is far more confident, almost like a personality switch. The suit empowers him, metaphorically I mean. He then notices something about Charlie in particular and calls her something beautiful. He explains that they will all be killed when the spirits wake up at nightfall. They don't remember what happened to them. They see the group as adults. They do not trust adults as adults took away their happiest day. And to top it off drops one of the hardest lines, quote, they will kill you. I'll just walk out in the morning, stepping over your corpses, one by one, end quote. John then heads off to try and find a way to use the control room's equipment and their radio to contact the outside. We then cut to Carlton's father sitting at his desk at the police station. He can't help but think about the Freddy's case given everything that's going on. So he heads down to the department's basement to go over everything they had on the case. From rereading the case file, we learn the name of Henry's business partner, William Afton. This was huge back in the day because both Dave and William Afton were the first names we ever had for Purple Guy. Can and names, that is, because Vincent does not count. We learn from this file how Henry was the inventor slash engineer, while William was more of the businessman. We also learn that before he became the deathly looking Dave, William was once a bit of a hefty guy. Carlton's dad then reiterates to himself how they all know William did it, how William disappeared during each of the kids going missing, how they found journals in his house with schizo rambles, rambles of how jealous he was of Henry, but also almost 
worshipped him and his talent, but as we know, they had no hard evidence to convict him. And after they failed to, William had allegedly left the town afterwards. No one knows where he went. After going over these files for the first time in a while, Carlton's dad realizes something. He goes and finds a background check they performed on a Dave Miller. While comparing the pictures, despite the obvious weight differences, he could clearly see that the face was the same as William Afton's. Carlton's dad then goes over more old crime scene photos. He notices in almost every picture, Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica are staring right at the camera with their silver eyes. But finally, Jason wakes up. After assessing his leg wound, it seems that the gash isn't too bad. Foxy pulled him by his jeans and not actually his leg itself. He quickly realizes he's in Pirate's Cove. The curtains opened like a show was about to begin. Foxy then stepped up onto the stage with Jason, but didn't attack him. Foxy knew he was there, but he didn't really seem to care. Marla and Lamar finally decide to leave Pirate's Cove's control room, and the light from Lamar's flashlight starts to activate Foxy. But Jason trips him using some cords, causing Foxy to fall and get tangled in his curtain. Absolutely bodied, bruh. The three of them then try to run down the hall before Foxy could recover, but Freddy Fazbear himself stood at the opposite end of the hall. His eyes were illuminated red. They heard quiet music notes from Freddy's music box. Now John, who is still in the main control room, spots them on the cameras. He somehow got the walkie-talkie connected to the sound system of the building and informs them that there is a room they can hide in. The three of them then run into the party room and hide under the tables. John John warns them yet again to not move as Freddy enters the party room they hid in. But just like that, Freddy flips the table they were hiding under. They were now completely exposed and absolutely done for. That is, until the goat Charlie and down bad John shat on Freddy, causing him to fall face first into the tables. Funny thing is, in the book, they don't really say how they did this, just that it happened. So I don't really blame the graphic novel for having it look so goofy. The entire group is now back together in the main dining room. However, now alone, William is able to break free, I'm gonna stop calling him Dave now, is able to break free from his binds rather easily. The group then tries to go back down the hallway to the same office they had hidden in before. Finding it now locked, they try to get back into the main room, but are now cut off by Chica. Since this hallway was a dead end, they were trapped. With no way out, John charges at Chica to try and solo her, but gets thrown into a wall like it was nothing. Mr. Cupcake then BMs him by laughing. I, I don't know if I could take that level of BM, bro. A fucking cupcake, dude. As Chica slowly approaches the group, my goat Charlie grabs a wire hanging from the ceiling and sticks it into Chica's neck opening, causing her to short out. However, due to the electrical current, Charlie couldn't open her hand. She was stuck holding it until Lamar pulled her back. Charlie, my goat, had soloed Chica. They run over Chica back into the main room just to be stopped by Foxy. But my goat Charlie then lures him away and runs into the arcade. She crawls behind the arcade cabinets just like we saw at the beginning of the book. Once Foxy finds her, he slashes down at her, but Charlie dodges the hook, causing an arcade cabinet to fall on Foxy, trapping him. But as she tries to escape, Foxy's hook catches her leg, cutting into her. She kicks at his face in retaliation, causing the hook to come free from her leg, but cutting it terribly in the process. Before she could even get back up, Foxy was on top of her, continuously slashing flashing down at her. She tried to block as many as she could while screaming for help. Down Bad John then steps on Foxy's neck and repeatedly stomps on it. Taking a quick moment to help Charlie up, they run back into the main room to regroup with everyone else. Although limping, Charlie feels no pain in her wounds, thinking to herself that this means they're much worse than it seems. Now I could allude to this being more foreshadowing, but you could also argue that that can just happen from adrenaline. The group was now trapped in the center of the room. The four animatronics were now blocking every exit. They were all closing in on them, getting closer and closer. The group went quiet and were basically preparing to die. Foxy stares solely at Charlie, his silver eyes burning into Charlie's mind as they always had. Oh, that's why they call it that. The animatronics were now directly in front of them. Before they prepare to attack, they stop, their eyes still glowing, but they remain motionless. Charlie then notices Golden Freddy now standing in the corner of the room. They, the whole group starts hearing quiet whispers in their head. They recognize the voice just as Carlton had. They all started walking towards Golden Freddy, ignoring the animatronics in front of them. They were all astonished and almost relieved to hear Michael's voice. Unlike the other suits, it was empty, but yet it was standing. It finally clicks with all of them that the animatronics behind them are literally the kids. It wasn't just their bodies that are stuck in there, they are still there. Foxy was trying to protect Jason and Pirate's Cove. Carlton's father then suddenly breaches the seal at the entrance. When Charlie goes to look back at Golden Freddy, he was no longer standing. He was slouched over and the whispers in their heads were gone. Carlton's dad then started escorting them out of the building. Charlie, who was in the back of the line, was dragged back by her throat, unable to scream due to her windpipe being crushed. She was whipped around and handled just like a toy. She came face to face with the yellow rabbit. Before Carlton's father could even act, the yellow rabbit began choking her harder, keeping him from acting at all. William releases pressure on Charlie's neck and tries to give a list of demands to Carlton's father. However, in this moment, it hits Charlie all at once. This is the man that killed Michael, that killed Sammy, and all those kids. My goat Charlie then drops a bar, quote, if you want to be one of them, then 
be one of them, end quote, as she triggers the spring locks near William's neck. She breaks free, causing the rest of the spring locks to trigger. They all watched as the man screamed and twitched on the floor, and even when he stopped screaming, he was still spasming. The animatronics came down the hallway and dragged Afton back into the pizzeria. The group leaves. It was finally over. Charlie refused to go to the hospital for her wounds. She didn't want stitches, as she wanted the scars to prove that this happened to her, and that this is what it did to her. She is clearly and understandably traumatized by everything. Carlton's father then explains he will go back for Dunn's body and see to it that he gets a proper burial, and make sure that people know that William is responsible not only for Officer Dunn, but the kids ten years ago. After all is said and done, and the group begins going their separate ways, after all of this, down Bad John still has the balls to ask Charlie if they'll ever see each other again, and she only hits him with a maybe. The book then ends off with Charlie visiting her father and brother's grave for the first time. Whew. Okay, after 8,572 words, we can finally get to the actual review portion. Although I did give some of my thoughts throughout the recap, now we can actually go into a little bit more detail on them. If there's one thing I can say about the Silver Eyes, it is how well it fleshes out William Afton. As I said in the recap, at this point we had no canon name, nor did we really know anything about him. Apart from the fact that he's a serial killer, obviously. I'd even say that it does it far better than the movie. Now, I know in the movie's case, that's due to how the mystery was structured in the movie, so you couldn't really have a lot of time with quote-unquote Steve Raglan. There's just something about the way they characterize him that just fits William so well. This confident, smooth-talking guy who looks like he'd be the opposite. This completely unremarkable guy that no one would notice, and for that reason, he's able to almost get away with some of these very heinous things. Someone who does a fruity little dancey dance in front of his victim. Just plain and simple, bro is weird. Straight up not normal. Now, I know a lot of people actually don't like the characterization of William in the books, but I'm not gonna lie, I think a lot of that stems from how much fan and headcanon people had. You know, because he didn't look or act the way that people had already pictured in their head. And honestly, I can say you see a decent bit of this version of the character in the movie. Obviously not one to one, but they both take up false identities. They both keep the pizzeria standing and are just kind of weird. It only comes through a little in his scenes, but Matthew Lillard does a great job of having these small little quirks that show us this man is a little strange at the very least. One of the biggest negatives and one of the things I find the most interesting is how little part the animatronics played in the book. If William has done better here than the movie, then it needs to be said how much better the movie handled the animatronics. Outside of Charlie's personal connection and memories of Foxy, they don't really do anything until the finale. I really feel it's because of how bloated the book is with characters. There are seven main characters, Charlie being the actual main character of course, but we have to learn about, characterize, and see the perspectives of seven characters in the main group. That's not even counting William or Carlton's father. However, I will say the sequences we do get with the animatronics are pretty solid, and it's little things like Bonnie's breath smelling absolutely abhorrent, being a clear foreshadowing that the bodies are still in the suits, or Foxy trying to protect Jason by hiding him in Pirate's Cove, just how the animatronics sort of protect Abby in a way. Although the only thing that I think is cooler than the movie is Freddy having his music box. I was honestly surprised there wasn't a single scene in the movie utilizing it. The movie just does a much better job at characterizing the animatronics, so if you came to this book hoping for that same sort of focus on them, you'd definitely be pretty disappointed on that front. Even as a kid, I've always liked Charlie as a main character. FNAF 6 then confirming her to be the puppet in the game's continuity was still one of my favorite reveals. Now, like I said at the beginning of the video, I won't be touching things that are from future books, so I won't be addressing, you know, that. I don't know why I'm trying to avoid saying spoilers, but I'm just trying to review the book on its own since at the time, the other books did not exist. Charlie always felt like a pretty real depiction of a person with significant trauma to me. How she always distances herself from people and how much she suppressed her past. On top of all of that, she straight solos Chica and William, so... The other characters are likable too, I still think there are way too many of them. I think it should have just been Charlie, John, Carlton, and Jessica. Charlie Lamar. Jason could remain and just be Jessica's little brother instead, but I don't think he's really crucial to the plot, and I like Jessica and Carlton, so. I will say that John is my least favorite character of the group. His entire character and nearly everything he does is in service of Charlie. I understand he has feelings for her and wants to help her, but there are so many moments where he just jokes around with her in moments where it honestly makes no sense. Hence the name, Down Bad John. I think you can have a character written to just kind of be the main character's love interest, but it tends to not go so well depending on the author. For example, a lot of people would point to Karin Uzumaki being an example of a character that is just motivated by her love interest. I find her pretty funny personally, so I've always liked her, but it is true that she never really does anything if it isn't just for Sasuke. However, I would argue that within the same series, I think we see a good version of this, Hinata. 
Hinata is a good example of this character type. A lot of her screen time and lines are centered around her basically stalking Naruto. You could boil her down to just being the girl with a crush on Naruto. But, as we see in the Pain arc, she was changed by Naruto, motivated by Naruto, not just to get stronger for him, but so she could stand alongside him and be the best version of herself. But in this book, John is just kind of there for Charlie to vent to. Which is good for her, but it leaves John as just the most default man character ever. And yes, he does help with Foxy, so he isn't useless, he is just though kind of there. Overall, I think the Silver Eyes is very important. It was the first time FNAF had stepped into a medium outside of games, and I think it was a good first step. It's slow paced, but it's very character driven, and I personally really like character driven stuff. No, it's not the best book or even story in the franchise, but it does hold a special place in my heart. Nostalgia does play a factor there, but I feel like most FNAF fans who haven't read it and can actually read would probably enjoy it for William alone. From my memory, it only gets more interesting from here, but you wouldn't want me to cover the rest. Would you?